Hey guys, Tuckett here, and we have the first of three balance manifestos. What they've done this time is it was such a massive document to split up into three parts. There'll be one coming out, one yesterday, one today, one tomorrow. I'll do a video after each one, and then I'll do a final summary vid. Uh, each one is something like 15,000 words. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. I'll basically pull apart things that stood out to me. Uh, one of the main things that really stuck out to me, though, was this. Finally, we're changing elemental overload and elemental equilibrium. I've had a massive issue with elemental overload for a long time. I spoke about this, I think it was in one of my uh, videos about stuff I would like to see in 316. I've always had a massive issue with elemental attack builds specifically and how they feel tied to elemental overload, which is in which, and a lot of those builds want to be in the ranger area. So I really hope that um, they specifically talk about elemental damage over time. I really hope that when they make this change, they also think more generally about some of the other builds because this could be a really big change. This could open up loads of different build paths and this is the thing I am most interested in seeing. So with that out of mind, let's talk about part one, which is talking about elemental uh, mitigation, some flask improvements. Two will be character core defenses recovery and three is auras, curses, LA damage over time and then that stuff. Another thing to note, um, from some of the wording or the way they've broken this stuff up, there will be a little bit of context missing from one to another. And also, finally, finally, everything is subject to change. So, you know, just take everything you read with a slight pinch of salt. One thing I will say, um, I really like this new system they've got of problem, solution, specifics. I won't be running through the specifics of each one. I'll just be talking about the problem, solution, and then I'll just mention one or two of the specifics. So, ailment, ailment mitigation. In 315, we changed our flask around ailments and curses on you, but didn't provide enough reasonable alternatives to mitigating ailments. Solution, introducing a large number of options and improve existing options for characters to deal with ailments. Characters should now be able to pick between reservation skills that mitigate ailments, remove effects reactive with life or mana flask, gain immunity at cost through utility flask, or use improved modifiers on items in the passive skull tree to mitigate ailments and curses. Now, what I'm hoping the result of this change will be is will be in a scenario where you have a couple of different options. So you have a low investment option, which requires more skill, in which case that would be um, stuff like using the utility flasks. Or you have a high investment option, which requires less skill and is more passive. That'd be something like using some of the new um, aura reservation effects we have available, or you know doing stuff like uh, going raider and then getting reduced um, effects from other sources, bit gear or the passive tree. And I think as long as nearly every single character has a couple of choices um, of do we go for the high investment or the low investment path. I think we have reasonable choices. I like the fact that you still have the skill based. Um, this is assuming they get flasks in a way that they're happy with, but you know, you have this reactive, more skill based approach um, and your reward for using the more intensive, more input heavy one is you're not going to use up mana reservations or maybe you're saving five or 10 passive skill points. And if they can achieve that, I think that'd be great. Uh, the main thing that stood out that people have been talking about is Prudity of Ailments uh, now not only gives more total resistances, um, it's a 50% reservation and it makes you immune to all elemental ailments. This is very cool. This will be a very strong option um, at League Start scenario. It's just something you pick up, you throw it on. The resistances will help get you into early mapping. You don't have to worry about having any of your flasks rolled early on into the League so you can save your alterations. And then it's something that you then drop as you transition into your normal build. Another thing which is worth considering this is generally you're not that starved for damage in an early mapping. So you can afford the loss of a damage aura. And then by the time you're getting into red maps and you're like, okay, I want to go against certain conquerors. I'm starting to feel a bit of a challenge. I need more damage. You can then drop the purity of elements, use any currency you've saved to either craft or buy other alternatives from gear or, you know, use your extra levels in the passive skill tree to invest into passive things. So this is a very good um, stopgap. And also in some cases, like if you've got an all amulet or you've got a watcher's eye with certain modifiers, you may even potentially use this in the fully end game. And again, as well as kind of talking about, there will be some people who just use this on their characters and be like, this will be the only thing I do because it's a very low barrier to entry, but it has a high cost associated to it. And the high cost associated to it isn't dependent on getting some random eye level 86 influence item, which is a reoccurring issue with PoE where you have these solutions to problems, but they're tied to very high eye level stuff. We do see a little bit of that coming in later when we talk about the flower stuff, but that's whatever. Um, also, Steel Skin uh, now gives uh, Bleed Immunity, which is pretty neat. 
Uh, one thing which is very notable, Brine King now gives you Cannot Be Frozen. So you still need to worry about Chill, but if you're a Saboteur, for example, um, then you've got Freeze, Shock, and Ignite just from your Pantheon and your Ascendancy. Um, they've generally, it seems like Pantheon themselves coming more powerful, so that'll be interesting. There's been a few quite interesting buffs in there. And were there any other big things that stood out in here? Um, bu -bu 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 mostly they've just been buffs. Yes, there's some stuff with jewels, but that's coming in later with some flask stuff. So, yeah, generally on the ailment stuff, um, I like the direction they're going with. We'll have to see what the final results are once they've settled on everything. And kind of seeing, you know, any of these new passive skill options, like how well are they spread out in the skill tree or whatever. Um, yeah, flasks. Many flask modifiers grant buffs during flask effects, which isn't well suited to a life or mana flask short and reactive nature. I agree. Uh, added new modifiers to life and mana flask that are impactful but brief and have a duration rather than applying during flask effect. Boom. Remove many flask effects modifiers to life. Boom. Uh, gives hinder. Gives immunity to hinder. Recover additional 40% of life recovery over 10 seconds if used while not on full life. This one I find very interesting. Um, also, I think it comes up later, but I'll mention it now. Um, they've halved the amount of time it takes for life flask to heal you. Um, so you get the full heal, but in half the amount of time, which generally just makes life flask a better source of healing. It also makes stuff like catalyzed much more attractive. And there's some stuff coming up later for rangers um, and getting a bunch of uh, stacked flask effects and flask duration, all that shenanigans. You could see some pretty interesting um, life recovery builds. And that's something I've messed around with before in the past with like stacking sources of increased life recovery, running catalyzed um, life flasks with flask effect belts and flask duration scaling. You can actually get some pretty insane um, health per second from that. But anyway, it's a future problem. Utility flasks are usually used proactively, but the ailment protection modifiers uh, work by reacting. Yeah, this was a big issue here. Um, solution, replace the ailment removal modifiers on utility flasks, the one that grant ailment immunity, but lessens flask duration. Again, I like this. So basically, if you're pianoing your flasks, then you have your total immunity, and it's all chilling, it's great, but it lowers the flask duration. So you have to make choices there. How do you want to do it? Do you want to have the proactive approach on the utilities? Do you want to do the reactive stuff, which is arguably more skill-based on the life of the mana flasks? Or do you want to um, have maybe some immunity from either ascendancies um, or auras or gear options, and then maybe just one proactive or reactive flask? Like, for example, just having a uh, freeze life flask or a freeze um, granite flask or whatever. And yeah, they've just give some examples of modifiers. Cool. Uh, problem, utility flasks are sustainable with enough character damage and clear speed, but there aren't enough ways to sustain utility flasks for less powerful characters. Solution, add new modifiers and improve existing modifiers on flasks that affect their duration or charge generation. Add some new passive skills to help sustain flasks. Extend the base duration of utility flasks, reduce how often they need to be used. Again, we'll have to um, see how this kind of lands based on where stuff ends up on the passive skill tree. You can already do some pretty dirty shenanigans with flash charge generation memes and they're also buffing in kindling orbs um to give more flash charge generation or more flask effect or duration or whatever you, you choose to use, like build them with um but yeah so this one i think this is something I, again i've mentioned before that i would like to see but increased charge recovery reduced effect i think this is a really interesting combo um especially when it comes to stuff like unique flasks or flasks that you purpose the um, roll in a way that you want them up active, but you want to lessen something which is associated with the flask, be it a downside, or there are some shenanigans or certain builds where you need to, like, soul thirst, for example. Um, you want the flask to be active, but not necessarily doing anything. Um, so I think this is a very interesting modifier, which will be fairly build-enabling in some senses. They've also just generally increased the duration of utility flasks. So these have gone up by two seconds. Great. These have gone up by three two seconds, three, two seconds. Um, we're expecting to see more unique fast changes. I'm definitely expecting something with Chalice, but we'll have to wait and see when we get the patch notes. And they say here, loan the power of many unique flasks, but they don't like go into all the examples. Uh, this is just a whole bunch of flask stuff. Um, so this is the whole idea. Chris spoke about this on a recent Baycast uh, when we interviewed him about 
adding uh, more powerful flask mods to higher item level. The idea is that you have some kind of like gear progression with your flasks. Currently for me in any way in SSF, the flask are the first thing I prioritize on rolling. It's something I would do by Act 10. Once my flask was set, I would never change them again. They then introduced the new um, orbs to empower our flask, which made the whole flask crafting process a little bit longer, a little bit more tedious. Um, the thing which worries me a little bit, this might be an SSF problem, is we're adding these new orbs, but you're not really going to want to use those to craft flasks under eye level 82. So based on their availability, we might be in this awkward situation where you have specific flask setups that you want, um, that you feel mandatory to use. If, for example, in this current league, you've gotten used to like the whole auto flask setup. Um, you're not going to want to use those on flasks which are under eye level 82. Depending on the weighting of them, rolling them could be really difficult. Alteration sinks is already a big issue. So I understand why they're doing it. Hopefully the availability is okay and that would just be something to look into. Uh, in Kindling Orbs, they're buffing them. Um, yeah, cool. I think that it's dumb that we can get one set of flask stuff on the bench. They they realize that was from after lots of complaining. And kindling orbs aren't on there. It's like I spoke up before. It's something I'm going to speak about again. I'll keep providing this feedback. Shoving kindling orbs on the bench as well. Um, belts. I'm really happy about this one. So belts are meant to be the flask slot, but a lot of people don't really utilize them for that. And I think the flask slots on belts are generally um, very... Um, underrepresented for how powerful they are and they've just made them better and added some new ones and they've taken them off the influence mod pool added them into the base mod pool which is good i've had a bit of an issue with influence items for a while um yeah these are great i'm looking forward to having some cool flask stuff but this then comes back to the whole smart loot conversation can we improve dropped items because the chance of me dropping a really cool sick flask bell is still trash but yeah um, problem, instant recovery life fast are the most reliable tool for survivability. In many cases, I would agree. Um, solution, keep the total life recovery from all life fast the same, but half the amount of time. So this is also quite earlier. So basically, they just heal faster. As I was saying before, um, sacking a bunch of increased um, flask duration, life recovery, um, recovery from flasks, and uh, running catalyzed. Yeah, you can get some really spicy recovery from that. Catalyze should be very strong and very interesting. And I like that we had, with the changes to low life, panicked life flasks are more of an option. Um, Panic life flasks are also better with this change because if you misclick the flask before you hit the 50% threshold, you'll still get a decent like burst of healing. Um, so this is a big buff to both panicked life flasks and catalyzed life flasks. Um, right. Problem, there are no accessible tools for players to change their charge gain method if gaining charges on kill isn't well suited to the slower playstyle. Solution, rework the survival jewels able through to take a ground so that you gain charges in other ways will reduce the charge gain from kills. These are still design in progress. I really like this. I like the idea of um, actually having a reason to do that quest. Uh, it could be kind of annoying if these still super mandatory that you have to like mule three of them. Um, what I mean by super mandatory is like if, for example... Like, oh, you really want to use this jewel for the Cirrus fight. This is both a cool and a lame thing. It's only Act 2, so it's fine. If this was like an Act 10 rule, it'd be a bit lamer. Um, but I do really like the idea that you maybe have a, okay, this is what I'm going to use for mapping. This might be what I use for like heisting. This might be what I use for certain boss encounters. I like the idea of swapping that stuff in and out. Giving players options is always a good thing. I kind of feel like flash charge generation shouldn't be tied to kills. Something we spoke about a lot on Bakers and talking to Chris. I wouldn't be surprised if some of our conversations kind of helped to motivate this because it seemed like he sort of shifted his philosophy a little bit based on some of the points that Nicky made, which were really good. But I do think that um, there should be some passive non-kill based generation baseline, and then these jewels could be a good way to either fully go in that direction or maybe go more towards the kill direction. I don't know. I think I'd rather see that way rather than this, which is potentially just a band-aid. Another problem they address is that they feel like rangers don't have a form of life recovery they excel at. Um, now, as somebody spends a lot of time in the acro phase acro part of the tree, we have to wait and see what's happening to defense. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw some changes to acro phase acro. I've spoken about that before in videos. But depending on how that part of the skull tree shakes out, 
I'd be very excited to pick up some interesting new uh, flask nodes. So yeah, they go into some examples here. They don't talk about what they're doing with the jewels. But added life regeneration if you use a life flask in the past 10 seconds and mana gained on hit with attacks if you use a mana flask. This is really cool. The mana gained on hit if you've used a mana flask is really, really interesting. Could be cool for some like mind over matter attack based builds. Um, again, depending on what ends up happening with stuff like Ellie Overload um, and EE, there are actually quite a few um, Ranger Ellie Overload style builds that would root through all the agnostic and mana stuff. It's a little bit redundant for the average just attack build because the average attack build, if they've used a mana flask, the mana flask will give them all their sustain. But still, if you're, for example, like, I don't know, a toxic rain build and you haven't got other ways of solving your um, mana problems, depending on the value of the mana gain on hit you get if you've used a mana flask, this could be a really good way of smoothing out those builds on bosses because sometimes you can be that awkward scenario where it's like, uh-oh, I've run out of uh, flask charges. I now can't attack anymore. But maybe with this setup, you could be a situation of like, okay, I pop my mana flask so I can attack indefinitely for the duration of the mana flask. And then maybe I get enough mana gain on hit that I can continue to spam Toxic Rain for 10 seconds. And then when my mana starts to drop, I then uh, press the mana flask again. So this could potentially, you know, let's say you've got like four or five uses on your mana flask, being like another 50 seconds of attacking on a boss. That's really cool. So I dig it. Um, added new passive skills in the range section of the skill tree that increase generation of life of mana flask, including gaining a life flask on hitting enemies. Cool. Added new source of life of mana flask charge every three seconds and life flask getting charges when you suppress spell damage. Again, uh, this is sort of what I'm talking about when I'm expecting changes to phase acro. Um, suppressing spell damage. I'm guessing what they're going to do, um, because there's been a big issue with like dodge and block being so powerful, um, is I imagine, based on this wording, is they will make sources of dodge and block more available, but rather than giving you 100% you take no damage, maybe it's you mitigate 70% damage. Um, so they kind of like do like a glancing blows kind of thing. Um, depending on if that's what they do and how available they make it, like if it becomes a thing where like every character is now expected to get some um, passive avoidance um, through very easy routing on the skull tree, then I could maybe be okay with it. Purely speculation, but suppress. Like if you were to, for example, um, suppress the urge to... Oh no, that's too dark. Let me let me pull that one back. If you were to suppress a fart, um, you're still farting. You're just hoping to fart quietly. Um, so if you were to suppress spell damage, then yeah, I imagine you'll still take some damage rather than ignoring it completely. So let me know what you think about that. I'm generally pretty in favor of all of this. There's a couple of things that could be a little bit... Bleh. Um, I really like this new format. I think it's very interesting. Very curious to see how this sort of like drip feed um, of information kind of goes long term. Um, I feel like people have been very pleasantly surprised by how well received this has been. I was a little bit worried when I learned that they were going for this kind of setup, that there might be a scenario where um, if they like front loaded something which seemed questionable, but was then justified in later context that people could react poorly. I'm kind of worried for the core character defense and recovery aspect um, because I'm expecting there'll be some things in here that people aren't happy with. I probably would have saved that for last, but maybe that's their thought process. If they're like super confident on part one, like obviously they're confident in all of these changes, but they're wary of players' reactions. They feel like part two is good for the game, but they worry that some people might freak out a bit. But then part three comes up the next day and there's a slam dunk, then it makes sense. Again, very curious about the Ellie Overload. That's what I'm most interested in. Let me know what you think of these changes. And as always, refer to the notes. I'm Taki. Have a wonderful day. Goodbye.